I encourage you to take your Bible and follow along with the lesson of the hour as we will present a lesson from God's Word this morning. It will be beneficial to our lives as Christians and be strengthened in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'll talk about our Lord just for a few moments. Kind of bring the springboard to our lesson and talk about the things that really are issues even today when it comes to truth and how sometimes truth will cause things to be not what it should be. Now, sometimes it, it, it affects people adversely. And this is one of those times when your people are offended because you spoke the truth to them. And Jesus was no exception to this. As we take our Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, take your Bible and turn over there, if you will. In Matthew chapter 15, we're going to look and see what happened on occasion when Jesus offended a certain group which we often refer to the Pharisees and such. In verse 7, he talks about it, Matthew 15. Here Jesus says, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the precepts of men. After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Verse 13, we'll talk about that again in a few moments. But I want to stop there. And we'll talk more about this in the last. We're going to see why they were offended. And we understand he, Jesus called them hypocrites. And we're going to look at that and see how that actually plays out, why Jesus said what he said about them. And that's exactly what the nature of truth does sometimes. It will offend those who don't believe and stand for the truth. Well, that's the question we'll look at for a few moments. How can the truth offend anyone? Because we know what the truth is. The truth, there's a nature of truth that it's what's right, what's proper. It's exactly what God's Word says. It's the standard of truth. And Jesus was only the one who gave us the truth. There was no falsehood, no error in anything He said. As He was the Son of God who did all things well and perfectly while He was here on this earth. And in Matthew chapter 10, 34 to 36, Jesus said and on one occasion to those who were listening to him, he said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. That's often a very curious statement because Jesus was the peacemaker brought between the Jews and Gentiles, brought them together. And here Jesus say, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. Now, I think if you have to qualify that, and you look at what Jesus is saying, is that what I'm teaching is going to cause division. Because why? Because there's people already have in their minds what the truth is, and it's not what the Bible teaches. That's really what the problem of the Pharisees. They had a lot of errors. They had a lot of misconceptions, false notions, and simply wrong beliefs. And that's exactly how well, when Jesus came bringing the real truth of God's Word, that brought a sword. It brought you might say, controversy to error. And that's really the nature of truth. When there is error and there's truth, there's always going to be a conflict. There's always going to be that rub against one against the other. And there's a conflict we see every day. You may even feel this today when you're trying to talk to people about salvation and other issues. We'll look at that in a few moments. But Jesus said, verse 35, He says, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. You know, again, because of the truth, there'll be people who don't like the truth, will fight against the truth, and that's why there is the enemies. Even in your own household, one could go against you and even turn on you because of the truth's sake. That's exactly what Jesus said, that truth would happen in those times. Now let's look at the nature of truth. Again, that gives us an idea of why it is that truth can be offensive. Well, first of all, truth is objective. And we know that the word objective refers to the idea of something that's concrete. It's not 
giving the change. There's something that you can see, and it's, it's something that's not relative, not subjective. In other words, truth is always truth. It's truth for you, it's truth for me. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul would say, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but to be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. Now, how could that be possible if there was no objective truth? It would be extremely hard for any of us to agree on anything if there was not objective truth in the Word of God. That's why Paul would say to, about Timothy, how Timothy would come to the church at Corinth, who reminds you of my ways as I teach everywhere in every church. And I use this passage a lot should refer to the consistency of truth. That truth is uniform. That every church ought to have the same doctrines, the same work, the same organization, everything about the church that Jesus established. Paul didn't go one, word, one place and say, I'm going to preach it flat here. I'm going to preach it round somewhere else. No, you didn't find him teaching different doctrines when he went to a different churches because there was only one church in the New Testament. That's why he could say, I, I teach the same thing everywhere I go in the church of Christ, because that's the consistency of truth. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1, this is a passage we use oftentimes. We're talking about the collection for the, we do every first day of the week, even today. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do also. And you think about that. That was not something, well, we, we decided we're not going to take up a collection at, at this church. But maybe they may do that there in Galatia or maybe other places. But here in Corinth, Corinth, we're not going to do that. Well, if they did that, they'd be wrong because truth is objective. It's not subjective. It's not for every church to decide what they want to do. That's sometimes why truth offends people. They say, well, we can't do that. We can all, all believe the same thing. How many times have you heard that? That every person has a right to their own belief? That actually fights against the truth, doesn't it? That actually hinders true unity on the truth of God's word. And then truth is exclusive. It's not inclusive. It doesn't just say, well, you, you can have one way, another way. At the same time, you can have maybe like the virgin birth. Or we don't believe in the virgin birth. It was, she was simply just a maid, like one of the translations, the RSV actually translated that way about the prediction of Micah, how Jesus was born of a virgin. Well, truth is exclusive. It excludes anything but the one truth, the singularity of truth, if you will. Look, take an example of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Here Paul says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say, that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, you think about that for a moment. There were some people at, at, evidently at Corinth, that church was saying, well, you know, if you miss the resurrection, there's not going to be a resurrection. If you haven't missed, I haven't been when Jesus was coming back, in other words, you somehow missed the boat. Well, that's the problem because Paul's basically correcting something, an error that was being taught. He said there's no resurrection. There was other people who taught that. The resurrection already passed, uh, like Hymenaeus and Philetus. And Paul talked about it to Timothy there. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Paul would even say, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's exclusive, isn't it? The name of Jesus is the one that we have to come to. And to be saved. And so truth is exclusive. It excludes any other name. It excludes Muhammad, Buddha, or any other man that would decide, well, there's salvation here when there actually is no salvation anywhere else. And truth does not change. We often talk about this. It's not changeable. It's not vacillating around. It's not something we find one day and it's changed the next. Sometimes people vote, and these churches and denominations will vote on certain issues, and their doctrine does change, but God's truth does not change. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Here Moses said, Now, O Israel, 
Listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Now here's what he says in verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now what he's saying here is, if you're adding to and you're taking away from it, it ceases to be the Lord's commands. And that's the problem that we see many times even today, is when men add to the word of God the New Testament age. It, it ceases to be Christ's words. When we put in all of our traditions, man-made traditions and dogmas and creeds, it loses that, doesn't it? That's why sometimes people are offended when we talk about creeds and creed books and things. Why, you know, why do you want to bash people's religion, we hear sometimes? Well, sometimes we have to do like Isaiah. God told Isaiah, sometimes we have to tear down before we can rebuild. And that's exactly what happens. We have to pluck up uh, anything that's not true in order to get the truth into our lives. Revelation 22 talks about, I testify to everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And also the same is true about the negative side, taking away from that as well. Now, again, how can the truth offend anyone? Well, when people don't like what's being said, when you talk about what they believe, and they don't like to talk, they don't want to have their, their beliefs examined by the word of God, you know, sometimes we are accused of being the bad guy, if you will. If we take the Bible and say, you know, what does the Bible say? I know what you say what men ought to do in religion and practices and creeds and things, but what does the Bible say? Sometimes people don't like what's been said there. Many don't like to be told they're wrong for believing something false. Isn't that the truth and really in nature of just anything? People don't like to be wrong. If you ever met somebody like that, I have met on several occasions people who never thought they were wrong about anything. And I tell you, it's challenging to get truth to someone who always believes they're right. You know why that's the case? Because they can't see past what they already believe. They already know everything. They already have the truth in their mind, and you cannot convince them what they're doing is error. But there's times when people need to be convinced they are. When they're believing false things, it's still false, isn't it? When truth exposes the error of what others believe or practice, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. There's times when we have to expose what is wrong. And now sometimes people don't like to talk about, well, I don't like to talk about other religions and things like that. But we do need to see the wrongness of what the false ways are. Because if we don't preach those things, then people are be apt to say, well, I, I believe this way. I want to believe another way. That's why people go off into denominationalism, into false religion because of that. And sometimes people fall in love with a particular false doctrine. And I've actually seen people who are enamored by error when it comes to this. 2 like Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12 actually refers to some in this way because they did not have the love of the truth, he told them in verse 11, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I used to listen to on the radio when I was on the mail route back a few years ago. And I listened to a man who was talking about how he was a Calvinist. And he loved all five. He said, I'm a five-point five Calvinist man. I forgot how he termed it. But he said, I believe all five points of Calvin. And, and you could tell he was in love with that doctrine. You know, to get him divorced from that, to get him away from that, was going to be a really big problem because he had accepted wholeheartedly. And that's where the problem. People sometimes, when you attack their doctrine, they take it so personal. They think it's so personal because this is what they believe. And you think, well, I can't be wrong because this is right. And so that happens many times in how why people are offended because you attack their beliefs. You're not attacking them. I don't believe in personal attacks, but I do believe in attacking when false doctrine is being taught. Go against that in that regard. But then when truth goes against the long accepted beliefs, 
In other words, what has been believed for many, many years or simply the majority's thinking. When you go against that, you say, that's not what other people believe. Then sometimes people are offended because of that. And we see Bible examples of those who are offended by the truth. Matthew chapter 15, we looked in our lesson text. We didn't look at the first six verses. Now here's why the Pharisees were offended. Verse 1 tells us, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? There's the problem. The tradition of the elders. For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, what a profit you may have received from me is, is a gift to God. Then you did not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. We've talked about this several times, about the idea of traditions, human traditions versus God-ordained traditions. And there is a, a far difference. There's a far cry between the two. They're polar opposites. Because one is right. God's traditions are right. Men's traditions are always wrong because they have no basis. If we, are, we should try to bind them as if they're the truth, then we were wrong to do that in that regard. In Acts chapter 4, we see in verses 1 and 2, here when the disciples are preaching about the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says in verse 1, Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now I want to basically approach this like from fresh eyes. Who were the Sadducees? What did they believe? Why were they offended when they were preaching simply that Jesus rose from the dead? It was simply the truth was they were preaching the truth given to them by God himself as inspired of God by the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 12, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. If you go back to Acts 20, go forward to Acts 23, verse 8, it gives us a little insight to the Sadducees. Because it says here, For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Now Paul there used that against one another. They got them to fight each other there, the Sadducees and the Pharisees in Acts 23. But going back to Mark 12, and we're going to look at all of those scriptures, but one thing I want to do see is that they tried at great lengths to prove there's no resurrection. You go back to Mark chapter 12, and you see they came up with a theory that some of the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection, they came to Jesus and said, a man had seven, six brothers, all seven of them married one woman, and then she died, they were all childless. Whose would she be in the resurrection? They thought that was an airtight case against the resurrection. You know, it's almost like saying, well, whose would be in the resurrection? We don't even believe in a resurrection. Well, sometimes people make up these theories, these scenarios, in order to try to disprove the truth. That's exactly what happened here in Mark chapter 12, because they love the doctrine of no resurrection. They were offended when the disciples were preaching about a resurrection. And Jesus simply said, you are greatly mistaken. You don't know the power of God and about the resurrection. There'll be no marriage or given in marriage, Mark chapter 12 tells us. We'll be the, as the angels of God. So they didn't understand things. He said, you do greatly err, not knowing the truth about the resurrection. And in Acts chapter 17, the Jews who, the, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But they did not find them. They dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now, why were they offended? Because Paul was preaching against idolatry. Same in chapter 19 when Demetrius the silversmith with all the men of like, like occupation of silversmith to the, making these shrines to the goddess Diana. That's the problem is that they did not want to give up idolatry which was sin. 
In Mark chapter 6, it was there the woman who the Bible tells us that Herod had married Herodias, which was his brother Philip's wife. And so because of that, she was offended. Verse 19 and 20 says, Therefore Herodias held it against him. Talking about John the Baptist, because John said it's not lawful for you to have her, and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. In other words, Herodias, she held a grudge. She was offended because John, see, he had the audacity to say the truth that, you know, you don't have a right to have her as your wife. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Paul would say this, even to some of the Jewish brethren, actually the Gentile brethren, he says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Now he's talking about these Judaizers in verse 17. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. Now, they were actually having some, evidently having some influence on these Galatian Christians who were come out of, of, of idolatry and such. And here they had to be circumcised according to these Judaizers. Paul said that's not the case. You know, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? Like in chapter 1, he says they've been teaching a perverted gospel. When they bind circumcision, which the law of Moses bound that, but the law of Christ does not bind that. You know, Paul had to worry about his brethren because of that, in that regard. Now I want to talk about ways that truth can be offensive today. First of all, Preaching the God of the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. As we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. And we know Him who is true. We are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, imagine if in the first century, and we don't have idolaters rampant like they did in the first century. But imagine if, Paul was preaching and he said those words. Or someone reading this letter heard those words. And there was an idolatry in the audience that day. You think he might be offended because here there's one true God. Like Acts chapter 17, when Paul was at Mars Hill at the Areopagus. He talking about one true God which they were serving in ignorance. That's the same thing, isn't it? Well, who was offended there? What offends those who believe in many gods? or even like people today, the atheists, who believe in no God, they're going to be offended when you talk about the God of the Bible. There's, there's, there's the preaching of the Lord's church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And Colossians 1, 18 says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things... He may have the preeminence. What's Jesus saying there? It's his church. God gave him. He, he built his church. And it is his church. Well, what if we preach that today? And we do preach that, don't we? We make the application there that there's the Lord's church and men come along after him and built denominations. You know, many times it offends those who believe in many kinds of churches. When you can have Baptist, Pentecostals, and, and just have all kinds of, just name all the different denominations that are out there. Jesus already established one church. What our goal is not to start our own church, but to be a part of the church that Jesus already has established. That's one of the differences between the Church of Christ and denominations, is the fact that we don't believe in making denominations but simply be a part of what God has already established. And that's really what we need to come to, the, that realization. And people are offended sometimes when we say, well, denominations have no right to exist. And I say that without apology. Somebody once told me, never apologize for the truth. One time we was talking to a lady, a preacher friend of mine, uh, and, and I said, I'm sorry that you feel this way. He said, don't, don't apologize for the truth, but you can say, you're sorry for her reaction to the truth. I'm sorry that she feels that way. But do not apologize for the truth itself because truth, there's no apology for that, is there? And when it comes to preaching on righteousness, 
You think who would be offended about preaching about right living, the righteousness that God wants us to have? And Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24 talks about that. We put off the old man concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. What is he talking about there? He's talking about repenting. He's talking about putting away things we used to do, like lying and stealing, cursing, and all the bad things the Bible says don't do. And put on the new man created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, who's going to be offended about that? Well, it offends the sinner who loves sin. You're talking to somebody that loves drinking, gambling, and drug use, whatever the sin. You just name that sin, homosexuality. You talk to someone who believes in that, has their lifestyle wrapped around it. We'll talk about that in the next lesson. They're going to be offended when you say that's wrong. God wants us to repent. Stop doing that. They're going to walk away from that thinking, I'm so offended because he told me I had to quit being the way that I am and living the way I live. And so that sometimes happens, doesn't it? We get called the bad guy because we're simply saying what the Word of God says. That's not me saying, not you saying that. You know, the bottom line really is the truth says it doesn't. All I'm doing is saying what Jesus said a long time ago. It's written for us that we understand and believe and know the truth is. Now, preaching on true worship versus false worship. We've had lessons on those before. Now, why would somebody get offended if you're trying to talk about what correcting wrong things about worship and getting rid of error? There's a lot of people today because they practice those things. They don't like that. In John chapter 4, 23 and 24, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, and she was a Samaritan who worshipped like the Samaritans on the hills of Samaria. And the problem with that was, Jesus said, you know not what you worship. For salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship. We, we, we are, salvation belongs to the Jews, Jesus was saying. You know why? Because there was true worship, there's false worship. And Jesus was right about that. What offends people today when you talk about instrumental music, how there's no place of it in worship today, when you talk about prayer beads and, and, and maybe doing several things that people do, having praise teams, choirs, and solos, and any of things like that. Sometimes people walk away offended because you said something about what we do at our church, and I don't like that. Well, the problem is, is it in the truth? That's what matters. If we can put our finger on the verse and say, you know, this is what the Bible says, that's well and good. But if we can't find book, chapter, and verse for what we do in our worship, then we need to not do those things because we are arguing on the silence of the Scriptures when it comes to that. And ways truth may offense today is preaching on the work and organization of the church even. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, Paul, actually Peter's talking about the eldership, how that they rule, you might say, they oversee the church among them. You know what that actually is talking about, the idea of autonomy, church autonomy. That every church, every local church, needs to have elders that govern the flock and that one church can't oversee the work of other churches. You know, that sometimes happens with the church sponsoring arrangement. You know, I had to study a long time about this. I came to the conclusion, what happens when you have brethren who want to make one church's work more important than other churches' work? And this is really what happens if you think about this. Big churches say, well, you send us all, send us your money, and we'll do this big work we can't do by ourselves. You know, when every church needs to keep their own money and do the work that God has given each local church to do. What you have is feeder churches feeding the larger churches, and really there's no basis in Scripture for this. There is no activation of the, the universal church in this way. What we have to do is simply keep the autonomy of the church as it is. This church, we don't send to another church to do a work. Now we may send benevolence at times when there's a need to saints and things like that, but as far as losing autonomy, we simply cannot do that and be right with God. And when it comes to even the offices, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 talks about apostles and prophets 
and teachers, evangelists, and pastors, which are the elders. And Philippians 1, verse 1, talks about the, the bishops and the deacons. Now, what about man-made terms? Well, if we sometimes will offend people and say, you know, there's no such thing as an archbishop or a pope or a moderator or a youth pastor or youth minister. There's all kinds of ways people have changed the organization, even the work of the church, the fun and games, like youth rallies. There's no basis for a church to sponsor out of their treasury any entertainment like that at all. And brethren used to stand against this before they were for it in the liberal side of the church of Christ. And that's the problem even today. We have brethren who want to make this part of the work to, of the church to do things like this. And preaching on God's way of salvation, Acts 16, verse 31, believe, he told the, the, the jailer, the Philippian jailer, to believe on the Lord, you and your house, and you should be saved. That's rightly so. We have to believe, don't we? We have to repent, Acts 17, verse 30. We have to confess and be baptized. Acts chapter 8, 34 and, and verse, chapter, verse 39 talks about this. When the Ethiopian eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, you know what happened? Philip stopped. They both commanded the chariot to stand still. Philip went down the water with the eunuch, and he baptized him there upon his confession. He baptized him there. If you believe with all your heart, he told him, then thou mayest. That's when he made that great confession and baptism took place that day. You know, oftentimes we're told salvation's by faith alone in the religious world. It offends people sometimes when you say, you know, that leaves out repentance. It leaves out confession and baptism. If it's something only, if you add anything, one thing to it, like repentance or a confession or even a baptism, then that changes it, doesn't it? Well, that's why faith alone is not true. I know sometimes that offends people to hear that, but simply we have to believe and do all of what the Word of God says in order to be saved. And proper attitudes toward the offended, very quickly. Wouldn't it be kind, loving, and humble in our declaration of truth? Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In chapter 11, verse 29, he said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We have to be like Jesus, don't we? You know, sometimes people will be offended no matter what. You can say anything to them. They'll be easily offended. But if, it's, if we are kind, if we are loving, if we're humble about what we're trying to do, we're speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4, verse 15. That's exactly what we need to do. We may have to leave them alone. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew 15, going back to our lesson text. After right, he said, you know, the, the disciples came and said, you've offended the Pharisees. Well, Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. Sometimes we may want to convert them more than they want to be converted. And they'll still be offended. And, and sometimes it's hard to win people like that. But we have to simply pray for them. That's what the Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, they may know the truth. They will may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. How many people really fit this bill today? I've ran into several in my time trying to do personal work, trying to talk to people about the, the gospel. I've run into people that, that simply will not listen to you. They say, well, I'd rather not talk about this. Even members of the church who have gone off into apostasy actually talk like this as well, which is actually sad in this regard. But don't be discouraged. Bottom line, don't be discouraged if people are offended because you've taught them the truth. Stay strong in the Lord, just like what 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14. I'm going to leave this with you. The last verse of our lesson today. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith, Paul said. Act like men. Be strong. 
that all you do be done in love. I left out verse 14, but I, I added it for the part of the lesson in the handout as well. Originally, just had verse 13. He says, you be strong, be brave, but also be loving in everything you do. That's our, our job as Christians. That's our vocation, if you will. Not to be offensive. We don't go out of our way to be offensive. That gonna ha that's going to happen anyway, just like it did with our Lord. Thank you very much for your kind attention lesson. I will now prepare for our Bible studies.